dia. <laughs> so yesterday we we finished uh, by talking a little bit about uh, hard sweeps versus soft sweeps, and uh, I also showed you this slide where we sort of had the rate of successful establishment of a beneficial mutation uh, for NE mu s. Uh, and so we, we are all familiar with 4NE mu, which we call theta, which is a measure of um, genetic variability. And here we multiply this thing by S, and so this gives us sort of the rate of successful establishment, um, S being the selection coefficient, where at the beginning, when the new mutation pops into existence, it has a very high likelihood of being lost again by drift. And then if it's lucky enough and survives this stochastic phase, it becomes frequent enough for selection to, to drive it up in frequency. And we were like talking a little bit about how um, uh, prevalent such uh, soft sweeps might be as compared to hard sweeps. And uh, we were sort of arguing that um, if this 4NE mu s is large, in particular if it's larger than one, this number, uh, which can arise, for example, if the effective population size NE is quite large or the mutation rate is quite large or the selection coefficient is quite large, then this might actually not be so unlikely. So this is summarized here. Uh, soft sweeps may actually be quite common because in some cases mutation rates are high or the effective population sizes are very high. We have seen in Drosophila that the effective population size is on the order of 10 to the sixth, which is really large, right? As compared to humans, where we had seen um, that the effective population size is only 25,000. And if we plug in numbers into this 4NE mu s uh, expression, we can imagine that selection is probably going to be um, less prevalent in, in the human genome as compared to the fly genome, for example. And what is also clear is that selection can sometimes be quite strong. So soft sweeps may not be that uncommon. And we talked a little bit about some examples of rapid adaptation. And some time ago, classically, 20, 30, 40 years ago, people didn't really uh, have that many examples of rapid ad adaptation. They thought like things are going to take a super long time to evolve, right? And then it's, it's then people gradually realized that like adaptation can happen very fast, not only in the laboratory where you do artificial selection. I mean, in artificial selection, it's sort of trivial um, to see that selection can happen rapidly because you're doing the selecting and you're applying an extremely strong selection pressure. But even in natural populations, evolutionary changes can sometimes happen uh, quite rapidly. So we talked about Darwin's finches, uh, about the stickleback fish, for example, um, the peppered moss in, in the UK and so forth. And also in fruit flies, I mentioned this recent paper by a collaborator of mine and together with a colleague, uh, I, I wrote a perspective article about this, about this paper where they looked at uh, seasonal adaptation in fruit flies, where things can uh, change extremely rapidly. So I was uh, mentioning that these fruit flies you have to imagine a big panmictic population with lots of different genotypes. And some genotypes seem to be doing better uh, when it's warm and humid. And other genotypes seem to be, better, uh, seem to be doing better when, when the season approaches fall and winter. And so what you get are seasonal, over seasonal time, fluctuations in allele and genotype frequencies and also in phenotypes. And, and so they observed this in this study in, in massive population cages. Cages that you can enter, they're like really tall with like, a, I don't know, on the order of a million fly in each of the replicate cages, really well replicated. And they saw all these uh, genetic and phenotypic changes in parallel, uh, uh, suggesting that these flies really sort of adaptively track on an ecological time scale the prevalent conditions. Yes, please. Hi, hi, hi. Hi. Uh, can you explain again? I, I don't know no. if I got lost. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. Okay. Uh, why the title that uh, soft sweeps imply that adaptation is not mutation limited? I did not understand why. 
mm -hmm. because even even with I don't know like every variability is is yes. generated by yes. mutation. So why is yes. not mutation yes. limited? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, so here on the blackboard we have this expression that we had on the slide for any mu s, right? We don't we don't need to switch to the blackboard, but but you see it here, right? And and for any mu. What is for any mu? It's like a mutation rate scaled by something that we can call the effective population size. Let's ignore this factor four. Who cares, right? The theoretical physicists like approximations. So. Um, so it's effective population size times a mutation rate. So this is like sort of like a, a mutation rate that's scaled to the level of the population size, right? So we multiply the number of individuals, so to speak, with the mutation rate. And what we mean when we say mutation limited is maybe a little bit confusing because as you've pointed out, ultimately everything rests on genetic variability that originates by mutation. So in that sense, everything is mutation limited. If we stop the mutational process in the long run, we're going to run out of variability, right? And, and, and nothing is going to happen. Um, but what we mean by muta not being mutation limited is, is the following. We mean that we are in a situation where we don't need to wait for de novo mutations, right? You, you see, like, so I could have some pest insect, and then we're developing an insecticide. And let's say that pest insect doesn't have a huge population size, and, you know, it, it doesn't have a super rapid life cycle. So maybe this, this insect population sort of needs to wait for the right mutation to pop into existence. And so that can take some time. Uh, how long that takes is a function of how many, uh, how, how big the effective population size is and the mutation rate. So essentially for n, n e mu. Um, and so what we mean by not being mutation limited is like the notion that maybe the correct variability is already around, right? I mean, like even in this room, I mean, the, the, we probably, I don't know, we, we probably together in this room represent the majority of the genetic variability that we can measure in humans, right? So, so Lewontin, that, that uh, I, I showed you his mock shot and his 1974 book, he's very famous for having written a paper where he looked at genetic variability and genetic differences between human populations around the world uh, including, I believe, uh, some South American tribes, uh, different uh, ethnic groups, different indigenous people. And he used FST. I mean, this was pre-sequencing, so it was mainly based, I guess, on allosine loci. And, and in that paper, he showed that actually the differences that we can find, genetic differences between different groups of people, like the Yam Yam Yamomami uh, Indians in, in the Amazon in Brazil, uh, if we compare those to some people from somewhere else, these differences, I mean, we can find differences, but they're rather minor as compared to the amount of variability within the Yamomami or within another population. So most of the variability is present locally in a population. And the differences that we can even see, even, and, and we see obviously also phenotypic differences. We know, I mean, things like, you know, skin color, eye color, uh, different physiological traits. This is, this is not racism. It's just a fact that many differences between us are genetically based, including the fact that I have blue eyes, and he might have uh, uh, black eyes or brown eyes and so forth. There are genetic differences we can establish, even, for example, between African and European populations and so forth. But these differences that we can sometimes even phenotypically see are really minor as compared to the pool of variability within a group. That's why I'm saying, like, even in this classroom, we would, like, capture so much of the genetic variability already that's out there uh, for the human population. So that's what we mean by not uh, being mutation limited. Maybe there's already enough variability around for selection to act upon. But ultimately, even that variability comes about by mutation. And so in fruit flies, for example, where the effective population size is 10 to the sixth, there's so much genetic variability. I, I was mentioning, um, so there, like in that Lewin Twin book from 74, people had already done selection experiments using Drosophila for decades. And so now we have like, 
gazillions of papers where people have selected fruit flies for different traits. And there's practically no example, maybe one or two, where people did artificial selection or experimental evolution in fruit flies where they did not manage to select for what they wanted for. It's, I mean, you can pr pretty much select for anything. And the reason for that is that there's so much variability already around. OK, so we talked about uh, soft sweeps. We talked a little bit, not much, about polygenic adaptation, which is really a, a topic of a very much a current modeling and empirical research, because this is very common, right? Polygenic adaptation in, in many situations. And this is the sort of uh, most complex thing to understand. First of all, how do we identify the, the, the loci that contribute to an adapt adaptive trait? Because polygenic means that there's going to be many sites in the genome that contribute to that trait. How do we identify those reliably? How can we prove that they contribute to that adaptation? Uh, there might be interactions between these loci and so forth. And, and the signal that polygenic selection leaves, uh, is, is that signal is much weaker and much harder to sort of grab or grasp than if we have, uh, for example, a hard sweep which leaves this characteristic signature. Now, to finish this lecture off and before we go on, I wanted to talk a little bit about identifying selection based on the statistics of variant frequency distributions within populations. So this is uh, something I've alluded to in the last lecture. Like on one, on one slide, I showed you the, the frequency spectrum, the allele or site frequency spectrum. And so th this is also called the SFS. And we didn't really talk much about that. I'm not going to go into too much detail. But I showed you that, that figure. Maybe we can find it again. Yeah, it's up here. So here we have the, the frequency bins, right? Let's say, I don't know, singletons, so SNPs that only occur once in my sample. I have like a bunch of sequences, alleles for the same gene. And I count how many singletons do I have. I have a singleton in that sequence at this position, a different singleton on the second, uh, uh, in the second individual at another position, yet another singleton somewhere else. So the definition of the singleton is that they occur in only one of the sequences in the sample. So by definition, they're going to occur in my sample all at different positions. So this would be the frequency of singletons, let's say, then we can have doubletons, tripletons, and so forth. We can have these allele frequency bins, and here on the y-axis, we just like count up the frequency of these different classes. And so what this is saying here, this gray bar, is that singletons are the most common variants, right? Which means that rare variants, rare alleles or rare SNPs are very common, yes? And so here we have intermediate frequency alleles. So if something, for example, would be under balancing selection, then we would maybe see a strong signal of intermediate frequency alleles. And here are high frequency alleles. But we see that high frequency alleles are quite rare, for example. And so we can derive, even theoretically, from theory, we can derive the allele uh, frequency spectrum or the side frequency spectrum under neutrality, which are these gray bars here. And now we can, we can sort of calculate this and we can compare it to our real world data. And so here, uh, for example, we would have the signature of a sweep. So here for a sweep, we see that rare um, alleles are actually more frequent than we would expect under neutrality. So in other words, if you look here at, at these uh, uh, bars for the sweep, we see that there's a distortion or a deviation from the side frequency spectrum that we see under neutrality. And so there's a statistic that I want to uh, introduce you to that is called Tachimas D that we can use to sort of quantify deviations from that neutral, standard neutral side frequency spectrum. Again, maybe I should briefly say what we mean by um, standard neutral. Let me just find the right slide. Um, what we mean by standard neutral the scenario where all the, 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 the alleles we're considering, they evolve neutrally by genetic drift, in other words, right? And standard neutral, though, means that the population size is assumed to be constant. Because, and so we oppose that to other situations that are also neutral, but where we have demographic change. 
So alleles could be evolving neutrally, but there might be a population bottleneck. So the population is not constant anymore. Or the population might be evolving neutrally and there might be a population expansion. The population is growing. This would also be a neutral situation, but it's a non-standard neutral situation. Okay? And when we look normally at the site frequency spectrum, we often compare to the standard neutral expectation for the site frequency spectrum. So where things are evolving neutrally and population size is assumed to be constant, just to, to make that clear. And so it's possible to, to work out the frequencies at which variants are expected to be found in equilibrium populations under both neutrality and selection. And so when I say equilibrium populations under neutrality, I mean standard neutral, standard neutral equilibrium. And under neutrality, as we have seen in that site frequency spectrum graph, most variants are expected to be quite rare. We expect a lot of singletons, okay? But if selection is now operating on the sequences, it will affect the frequencies of the variants, obviously, right? And it's, it's going to distort this frequency spectrum, yeah? And so this notion forms the basis for some tests of selection. And a very commonly encountered one is called Tachimas D. And so in the first lectures, we've talked about pi and we have talked about Zeta Watterson, right? And we've even calculated that very commonly they give exactly the same result. Pi is based on the, is the average number of pairwise differences between the sequences. And Zeta Watterson is based on the number of segregating sites. And very often, these two numbers give us the same result. They give us the same result under standard neutral conditions. And so if we assume neutrality in the equilibrium, the expected values of both pi and Zeta Watterson both of them estimate for any mu, and under standard neutrality, we expect them to be the same in terms of value. But this is not always the case, because in fact, they calculate or estimate for any mu slightly differently. Pi is taking the, the, the frequency of the variance into account, whereas uh, Zeta Watterson is essentially just counting the number of segregating sites. But under standard neutrality, the two numbers match each other. And so what we can now calculate is the difference between pi and zeta Watterson, okay? Under standard neutrality, these numbers are going to be the same, so that difference is going to be zero, right? This is our neutral, standard neutral baseline. But they might not be the same under conditions that are non-standard neutral. What do I mean by non-standard neutral? Again, that could be neutrality coupled with demographic change. So it could be a neutral situation with a population expansion or a bottleneck, or it could be a situation where selection is acting, okay? So under standard neutrality, we expect them to be the same. And so this difference here equals a quantity that we call Tachima D. I say here, it approximately equals this quantity because the formula is essentially here. Tachima D, um, maybe we can switch, sorry, to the blackboard. Uh, thank you. So here we have Tachima D, and here we have the difference uh, pi minus Zeta Watterson. So that difference can be zero. It can be positive when pi is larger than zeta Watterson, or it can be negative when zeta Watterson is larger than pi. And I said approximately on the slide because we need to divide that by the variance of the difference, okay? But it's roughly, you can think of D as the difference between these two measures. Can we go back to the slides? This variance here is, is with respect to what? Variance in the, in, within the, the genome or variance across the population? What is the variance? Be, how is this variance? So it's popular? within a population normally, right? Okay. Um, and so pi and zeta Watterson, we usually calculate uh, not for, uh, I mean, we, 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 we calculate normally for, uh, for 
uh, along the genome even oftener. So, so we could like even calculate this sort of, you know, in, in 100 base pair window. So it depends a little bit. You could like calculate it for a gene, right? You can calculate for any sort of sequence. Um, often it's done at, at the gene level, but often we do it in sliding windows along the genome. And we can do the same thing for Zeta Watterson, right? So in some region of the genome that we're interested in, for example. So we can then even do it genome wide, gliding along the thing. And we can plot, we can even plot the statistics, you know, for the different chromosomes. We're going to plot how pi fluctuates, how Zeta Watterson fluctuates, and we can plot D. I'm going to show you a plot along some chromosome of how the D values fluctuate or change according to the genomic position. So you can just like sort of do it continuously along the, the genomic sequence, right? Okay. Okay. So under non-neutral, under non standard uh, neutrality, the two quantities can differ so that D um, is, is uh, larger or smaller than zero. And so, as I've just said, while Watterson's uh, method only takes the number of SNPs or segregating sites into account, pi also takes into account the frequency of the polymorphisms. And as we've just uh, said, if these two numbers do not equal each other, this means that, uh, that D is either uh, smaller or larger than, than zero. It suggests the possibility of selection. It does not prove that there is selection because it could still be a neutral situation. Maybe there could be a bottleneck or a population expansion. But it suggests that we're in a non-standard neutral situation. And so that's why this, uh, why this Tachimas D is useful. And so again, to, to say that again, Tachimas D is simply a measure of the deviation or the distortion from the uh, standard neutral site frequency spectrum. And so, for example, we might be in the situation where pi is smaller than Zeta Watterson. And that would mean that the statistic, the G must D, is negative. And what does that mean? It means that there is an excess of rare variance as compared to what we expect under standard neutrality. And this could, for example, suggest if we have more uh, excess of rare variants as uh, uh, compared to the baseline, that we have selective sweeps, for example. On the other hand, it could also be that pi is larger than Zeta Watterson, so then the GSD would be positive. And this means that there might be an excess of sort of intermediate and high frequency variants. So rare variants are relatively scarce. And this might suggest balancing selection, okay? So I'm just going to explain this here on the, on the blackboard. So I, I wrote this down. If we could switch again, please. Um, so up here, D equals zero, we're in the standard uh, neutral conditions, and pi equals Zeta Watterson. Now, let's look at the recent selective sweep. We've just seen that uh, on the slide that D if D is smaller than zero, this means uh, an excess of rare alleles. So how does this come about? Why is there an excess of rare alleles? Yesterday we talked what the sweep does, right? So imagine you have like a, a bunch of haplotypes and one haplotype is lucky enough and has the, the beneficial mutation. What is this going to do to the genetic variance in the population. What would we expect? It decreases, it decreases the genetic variability exactly at, at neutral linked sites. And that haplotype might just like contain some rare stuff, right? In a way. And of course, the beneficial allele itself at initially is rare, right? And so if we see an excess of rare alleles, uh, you know, in other words, singletons or so forth, it might suggest that there's a recent sweep. The problem is a little bit that there's also demographic scenarios that can lead to the same signature, which is, for example, the expansion after a recent bottleneck. A recent bottleneck is doing something similar to a sweep. The sweep sweeps away or sweeps out variability, um, right? So genetic variability at linked neutral sites gets lost. And that one haplotype that has like these linked sites is going to become frequent, right? Um, but in a bottleneck, something similar happens. In a bottleneck, genetic variability is greatly reduced. And if we have an extreme bottleneck, 
that means only a few individuals may, may, might make it. They could also be closely related to each other. I'm losing genetic variability, and I may, might get, again, an excess of rare alleles in my sample because of that genetic bottleneck. So in other words, the sweeps and, and, and then, okay, so, sorry, the recent bottleneck sweeps out variability. Um, why do we then have uh, an excess of rare alleles? Because I have, a, I have a loss of genetic variability, but these haplotypes might then gain new neutral variants. And so, in other words, sweeps and um, populations that are expanding after recent bottleneck are, are somewhat hard to distinguish. Conversely, D could be larger than C which means that pi is larger than Zeta Watterson. And this means that rare alleles are scarce. So there's a deficit of rare alleles. And this can, for example, happen under balancing selection, because under balancing selection, intermediate frequency variants uh, are supposed to contribute to balancing selection, right? Balancing selection, after all, means that polymorphism is maintained, right? So we might see. Uh, a, a, a deficit of rare alleles as compared to the standard neutral situation. And the problem is, however, that a sudden recent bottleneck that is not followed by a population expansion could lead to the same thing. So if you think about the bottleneck, you have a genetically variable population. What do we expect? We expect that very rare alleles will not make it, right? They will not survive the bottleneck. The things that are most likely to survive the bottleneck if we think about, okay, so let's, let's take us here in the room. We're all genetically distinct, but we share some variants as well, right? Certain alleles we share. We share those alleles by definition that have an intermediate or a high frequency, right? I mean, I'm not talking about the ones that are fixed. They're uninteresting. They're not polymorphic. But let's assume that like the, the frequency of some allele in, in this room here is 80%. Now we, let's imagine a bottleneck. So only two of us make it through the bottleneck. The probability that we have this uh, allele or this polymorphism is quite high, right? But if you know, I have a super rare allele that none of you guys have, and I don't make it through the bottleneck, that allele will be lost, right? We'll see a deficit of rare alleles. And this is what we see under both balancing selection and also if there was a recent uh, uh, bottleneck. And so these things are hard to distinguish. Can we go to the slides? Uh, I'm having a bit of trouble understanding what actually are the real, rare alleles, because you're talking about uh, excess of rare alleles when they don't become rare. Is it related to the frequency? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so I mean, there's always in a in a, in a population sample. There's always going to be some rare alleles, some alleles that have an intermediate frequency, or some alleles that are going to be common. And, and what we're just like looking at in this side frequency spectrum is the distribution that we would expect under a standard neutral situation. By definition, most of the alleles are rare. So that singletons are very common, right? All of us have singletons that none of us, uh, the others, have, right? So the singletons are the most common class, for example, right? So a singleton just meaning that. We have a bunch of sequences. We look at one position, and one of us has a snip there, a T, and everyone has an A, let's say. That's for me, right, at that position. But no one else has that T. Then we go to another position. You might have a different uh, base pair change there that is not shared by anyone else. So singletons are very common. And under standard neutrality, they're common. But so now we want to see, you know, how, how does the situation change, for example, if demography changes? And so if we have a certain recent bottleneck, that's going to, of course, reduce genetic variability, right, across all, the, across all the sites in the genome. But what we will see there as compared to the standard neutral situation is now that rare alleles are more scarce than we would expect under standard neutrality. And why is that? Because the bottleneck is, is affecting blindly you know, the number of individuals in this room. It's like, you know, for example, bottlenecks can be induced by poaching. When poachers like hunt down cheetahs, they don't know about the genetics of these cheetahs, right? They're like doing this blindly, whatever they can kill. 
or capture. And so we, we might have a drastic reduction in population size. This is going to bring down our genetic variability. And now you need to think a little bit, okay, so I know that rare alleles are common under a standard neutral situation, but how would the bottleneck affect that class of alleles? as compared to, for example, other frequency classes of alleles. So as we have just said, some of the alleles that we might have in this room might be quite common. So that 80% of us have that particular allele and 20% of us have the alternative allele, right? So which alleles are most likely to survive a bottleneck? It's the ones that are common, right? Or intermediate frequency. But the rare ones, you know, if I have a singleton snip that none of you guys have, and I don't make it through the bottleneck, then that's going to get lost. And so what I will see in the side frequency spectrum is under standard neutral conditions, I have like a certain number of singletons, for example, and now I see that that frequency class has dropped and has become more rare. So singletons have become more rare than we would expect under standard neutrality. That's, does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. I was it's, thinking it's a little bit abstract. Yes. But it's the variety of single tones that you have. Those are the amount of rare alleles. Yeah, so, so we need to consider the whole uh, spectrum, right? And compare the different frequency classes to each other. And what I was just describing here is, okay, so this, this is actually uh, the reverse situation from what we've talked about. But let, so this would be the sweep here, this bar for singletons, let's say. Mm -hmm. But let's say this would be standard neutrality. And now if we have, a we have a bottleneck, if we would have a bottleneck, then we would see that these rare alleles, these singletons, are more rare than we would expect, right? Okay. This is sort of what we mean. Thank you. Another question, uh -huh. uh, and it's more related to the Tajima G. Um, maybe I didn't understand how the P bigger than the water centita explains excess of rare alleles? Mm -hmm. so, so here, um, if we have a, a, a recent sweep, so maybe we can go back to this picture here. So, so we have a bunch of sequences here, right? And this guy here has a beneficial mutation, right? And this is linked to some particular uh, neutral variants at neutral sites, right? So what this picture shows here is that the variability, so if I look at the neighboring sites, for example, here is a neighboring site, right? I see there's quite a lot of variability. So, some have this allele, others don't have that allele, then there's a guy who has the same allele again. So there's some genetic variability, but after the sweep, that genetic variability has been lost, right? Because like now, every individual has the beneficial allele plus what was linked in that, on that haplotype, right? But that haplotype might be very special. It might be your haplotype. You have the beneficial allele, and you have particular variants around it that are closely linked to it. What does that mean? It means, you know, an excess of, uh, a potential excess of, of, of relatively rare alleles, right? And then the other contributing factor in terms of rare alleles is, now everyone looks like this, let's say, in that stretch of the genome. Everyone is fixed for the benefit variability has been lost. What is going to be happening now over time? Mutation. That's going to take some time. But then mutation is going to restore some of the variability. But again, most of the variants will be sort of rare, right? So that's sort of qualitatively what it means. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so that's what we, what we discussed here. And so, so we, we've been mainly talking about uh, selective sweeps where we see that the, the GMOS-D is uh, smaller than, um, is, is, is reduced, is smaller than zero. And so, for example, here we see that the GMOS-D is, is, is greatly reduced here, right? So the blue curve. And so this is a, is a, uh, now, the location of the selective sweep along the sequence position would be here, and we see this reduction both in variability, so this could be pi, the solid line, this could be pi or zeta Watterson, and we also see here this drop into GMAS-D where it becomes negative 
And so this is, if we see such a pattern in the genome, it might be quite indicative of a selective sweep. Again, it doesn't prove it because there could have been an expansion after a recent bottleneck, but it's quite telling. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a quite str a strong telltale sign that something might be going on. So strongly reduced Hachimas D under a sweep. And sometimes we also see increased linkage disequilibrium around the site of a sweep. Why might that be? Why might that be? Why is there more LD? I mean, the reason is, I'm going back again uh, to this thing here. The reason is here that, you know, here we might have more linkage equilibrium, less linkage here, because we have some variability. But here we have a lot of linkage, because like this site here is, is practically almost, almost always linked to this site here. So we might see an increase in, in the level of linkage as equilibrium or statistical association. Yes, please. Uh, how can we um, have a, a sense of which the time scale that uh, those uh, that those uh, process can be inferred? Because uh, you, like you, you, I imagine that it it's will change time. from species to species. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you say like we can infer past demographic. Uh, uh, events, mm -hmm. how far in the past this mm -hmm. can be detected mm -hmm. and... Let me just find that slide. Um, right. Um, that's an excellent question. So when we, um, when we look at the coalescent, so I'm just going to look at the sample of two allele copies for a gene and here but we could like, of course, like have a coalescent tree that, you know, we could like look at three samples and so forth. So we can generalize this, but like for two allele copies and here we have the MRCA, the most recent common ancestor. We said that the expected coalescent time, let's see, ECT, I'm going to call expected, expected coalescent time is 2N, right? But this is an expectation. And in fact, the distribution of coalescent times is sort of an exponential distribution. So somewhere here is like the, the average would be 2n, but there can be quite a large variance around this. And so on average, we can look back 2n generations. That can be a lot. I mean, so maybe it's better to say, to say 2ne, right? But so we have seen that in Drosophila, ne is 10 to the 6. 10 to the 6, right? So like we can look a lot of generations back into the past. Now what is sort of the maximum that we can look back into the past? And so that's uh, 4N, 4NE, we can look back into the past. But with sweeps, so this is for neutral stuff, but with sweeps uh, actually we can't look that uh, far back. So this is was mentioned here on a slide, we didn't really, I sort of glossed over it. But so such uh, an effect in terms of reduced variability, so for example, locally reduced pi, can uh, be detectable if the time since the selective substitution is sufficiently small, around 0.25 NE generations. Because the problem is, um, the problem is that here, or maybe this is, um, this is the same thing here. So here is again the, the selected locus, right? So this haplotype happens to have the capital A allele here at the, at the, at the linked site. So what we have is, is then this sort of haplotype. This is going to increase in frequency. Variability is going to be reduced. But this is the situation without any recombination. But given enough time and given some distance between the neutral site and the selected site, recombination events might happen. And because of recombination and de novo mutations, variability in the sweep region might be restored and I'm not going to see this super nice drop in pi so clearly anymore. So if the sweep is really, really old, I won't be able to use that signature, right? And, and so let's say a lot of the fixed alleles that we guys have, some of them might have been driven to high frequency and to fixation by selection. 
But if we would like now look at the uh, linked sites around that region, we wouldn't see that signature of reduced pi anymore. Okay, so we can't. We can We can only diagnose relatively recent selective sweeps. But in some models where effective population size is high, like in Drosophila, we can find many of these sweeps quite well. And so that's. Um, I'm going to show that to you in a second. Um, so right. Okay, so this is this pattern here, Thomas, and so yes, please. Sorry, uh, sure. Can you return to the, la, the previous, please? Just this no, one. No, 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 just the, the yeah. diagram. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not getting how you can obtain the in just one position of the sequence, uh, for example, the Tajima D, because I felt that pi it's like kind of a comparison, an average comparison between two um, sequences. sequences? Uh -huh. So, I mean, it's in all the sequence, not just one position, and it depends also in the population size that you are comparing, right? Is is not just, I mean, it is not quite of uh, like. Um, well, so so when we when we calculate pi, population size doesn't directly enter, right? We're uh -huh. we're like looking at um, a stretch of sequence, thirty nucleotides, and we're like doing all pairwise comparisons. We're counting up the differences, and there, then we're averaging across all the nucleotide positions, including okay. those that are not variable. So we get the average value for that stretch of 30 nucleotides. But that average is per nucleotide position. Huh? It's okay. an average. So it's expressed per nucleotide position, but it takes into account the, the whole sequence length, right? And, and, when do you know that the and so we can do this in sliding windows, right? Okay. So it's, I mean, you know, in, in overlapping or non-overlapping windows, we can calculate this, yeah. When, when you know that the sample size is enough to, to obtain this, uh, because I don't know in your experiments with Drosophila, when you know, for example, I need 100 um, flies or something like that to obtain this variability inside with that, or because you are comparing like an average and mm -hmm. you need an enough number to, mm -hmm. to find that variability, so mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. how you can. I mean, you can also do, I mean, you can do statistics on, on so if you have like pi estimates for the same sort of um, sequence or the same gene from two different populations, for example, and you see a difference in pi, you can like sort of do statistics on, on these numbers as well, right? And you, you could like do things like power analyses, I don't know, that's a little bit of a vague answer, but uh, okay. yeah. So it would like sort of look like this. Now I've already mentioned uh, here on the board the, the, the problems with the interpretation, which are again summarized here on the slide. There are several problems with using Tachimas D. Yes, please. Uh, we are talking a lot about these sweeps, but in like positive and direct selection. But what about the purifying selection? We can have like ah, a yes. region of yes. very you know mm -hmm. a higher variability and say oh. This uh, it's from a purifying selection. It's a gene mm -hmm. that was depleted by uh -huh. evolution. Yes, exactly. Yes, we do. Yeah, because that's because I'm so interested in positive directional selection. Mm -hmm. So, so this is uh, so this is the situation that is summarized here. We call that often background selection because the deleterious alleles. I mean, they're very common. They're like super common, right? If you look at the distribution of fitness effects, and they sort of happen everywhere. And that doesn't leave a very clean uh, signature in terms of neutral polymorphism. So we, we you know, so under background selection, we don't uh, necessarily see that so cleanly uh, in terms of, you know, um, we don't see this, this nice localized reduction in, in variability. Yeah. So, so as we've mentioned, uh, there are several problems with using Tachimas D. So first of all, this is getting back to your question. We need statistical tests to decide whether a sample could not have arisen by a chance process of neutral mutation and drift. And, and only um, if, if we have these statistical tests can we then sort of firmly conclude whether selection has been affecting the sequences or not. And, and then secondly, the problem is that the, the population might not have been constant in size, as is, is assumed in the standard neutral model. So the demographic history might cause these numbers to not be the same, right? 
So if there's an expansion or a bottleneck, as we, as we have seen. And as I've mentioned, the negative value of the G must T can be caused by a population expansion after a recent bottleneck, and the positive value could be caused by a sudden population contraction. So even though we can calculate a G must T, and if it deviates from zero, it doesn't necessarily mean selection. But let's look at this for the, for the situation of bottlenecks and selection. Both can cause negative to G must D. So if we look at the spread of an advantageous mutation, so a sweep, diversity is very much reduced like in a bottleneck. But in a sweep, we mainly expect that in a localized fashion around the, the selected loci. We see this localized dip. But for a bottleneck, we might expect to see that across a big stretch of the genome, maybe even at the level of the entire genome. We don't expect it to be a, 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 so localized. So we often say that selection should leave localized signatures, whereas demography should like leave a more genome-wide trace. Um, so let me just, before I answer your question, look at uh, what I have here. Yeah, so in an extreme bottleneck, we might have only one haplotype present that made it, and then new variants will accumulate. And so this would lead to a similar picture. But for a fixed advantageous mutation, we have a single beneficial haplotype that's selected. Uh, but in contrast to a bottleneck, the G must D might be expected to be reduced only in that localized region. The, the idea that you will see it, uh, the signal spread it sounds very, uh, very reasonable to me. But you said, you phrased, uh, in the case of a, of a bottleneck, you would even see, you could even see it uh, in the whole genome. I tend to think that the, that the default would be to see it in the whole uh, of the genome somehow, isn't it? Because uh, if you, like at least in the whole of the genome where variation that uh, there exists in the population, I expect that you would see something like that. Uh, under a bottleneck? Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Exactly. Yes, yes, sorry if that was not, yeah. We would expect it to have a genome-wide effect, we, okay. we normally think exactly. Or at least in most parts of the genome, yeah. Okay, so now just to finish off, two quick examples from, from flies and, uh, and then a few other slides. So a lot of people do these sort of genome scans for sweeps. I mean, a lot of people are now interested in polygenic adaptation. That's slightly different. We'll talk about that uh, when I, I get to my uh, uh, empirical talks. But a lot of people are looking for these sweeps. And so we call them genome scans, these, these searches. And there's a lot of uh, interest in using scans of variability across the genome to, to look at such sweeps. And the hope is that this will lead to the identification, obviously, of mutations that have been favored by selection. And then maybe you can do some follow-up work to sort of understand why was this mutation selected? What does it do to phenotype and so forth? And so there's like many papers. And so here is like one I like, uh, a PNAS paper from 2008, where they uh, identified a selective sweep in a, in a gene region that's called polyhomeotic. And so here, again, we have the sequence. And here in this gray area is like where the sweep supposedly happened. And so the solid line here corresponds uh, to Sita Watterson, and the dashed line corresponds to pi. So pi minus zeta Watterson is going to be negative here. So we're going to calculate the difference between these two values. And we see this relatively localized dip. And um, actually in that paper, uh, so Wolfgang Stefan, he's a, a, um, he was a professor at the University of Munich, a very famous population geneticist. He's actually a physicist by training, biophysicist by training, and then went into population genetics. And he's very well known for both having done and still doing very important and good theory. So for example, he's very interested in the theory of polygenic adaptation, but at the same time, he had an empirical uh, part of his work in, in Drosophila. And so this is an uh, empirical paper of this poly uh, polyhomeotic gene. And so in his group, they developed a, a statistic which is called a, a composite likelihood ratio test, which gives you statistical confidence that you're really dealing with the selective sweep. But it's also based uh, 
on, on these variant statistics. So here, that's how it would sort of look like. And so this is an example from uh, work I have been involved in. This is a paper that we published in 2020. So together with my colleague, uh, Josefa Gonzalez in Barcelona in 2013, we started a big consortium of Drosophila population geneticists in Europe, but now it's worldwide and we have some members from South America. Uh, as well, um, from Colombia and uh, Brazil and Argentina and other places. And so this consortium is called DROSEU, the European Drosophila Population Genomics Consortium, but now it's really international. It has like about 200 researchers. And when we did this in 2013, we said like, okay, what we would like to get are samples from all over Europe. So researchers interested doing fruit fly re uh, research they're contributing samples that can be sequenced. Because like the biggest, the biggest problem in like studying genetic variability is not the sequencing. The analysis can also sometimes be a little bit tricky, but like these things are relatively trivial as compared to having good samples. And so in Drosophila that I'm studying, we know a lot about Drosophila populations in North America, in Africa. We barely know anything about Drosophila melanogaster populations from South America, for example, systematic. And Europe, we also don't know much. So these fruit flies, they're of sub-Saharan African origin, like, like humans. And so there's a project that looked extensively at genetic variability in Africa. That's where most of the genetic variability in the species is, similar to humans. If we go to you know, Eastern Africa, we find a huge reservoir of genetic variability, more than we have in other places. And the same is true in fruit flies. But the fruit flies, like humans, 10,000 years ago or so, migrated out of Africa and then colonized the Middle East and from there went into Europe and they became only cosmopolitan starting 10,000 years ago. They have actually only colonized the North American East Coast something like 200 years ago. And fruit flies have only colonized the Australian East Coast about 200 years ago. Europe maybe 10,000 years ago. And we didn't know much systematic about genetic variability in Europe. So we contacted, Pepe and I contacted all of our friends and colleagues in the community to bring them together. And since 2013, all the members have been locally sampling Drosophila populations twice a year. And so this is like our first paper looking at um, 48 population samples from 32 locations in Europe. So this is like the biggest, this is like a, a, a continent-wide analysis of genetic variability in this species, which hadn't been done before. And what I'm showing you here um, is the D statistic, so the G must D, sliding along the genome. So here we have like uh, the genomic position. And so this is a particular chromosome and a, a particular region of the genome. And so the, all the, the different curves here, so the, the average is here like the stippled line, but all these color coded lines are different populations from different places. And what is really interesting is that m practically all the populations show this rather localized dip here in, in the G must D, okay? And it tends to be quite localized. And that probably means that the great majority of these populations share that selective sweep. And that is quite interesting because most studies of selective sweeps, like for example this one, most people who have studied selective sweeps in this and other species, they look at one or two populations. So here I think they looked at the African population and maybe one from Sweden to look at these things. And they had very clear signatures of a sweep but, but so here we have evidence that uh, there's a sweep region here that's shared across many populations. So all these populations share probably these adaptive mutations, which could mean potentially that these mutations already happened before the flies colonized Europe potentially. So some of the sweeps could be of African origin and everyone has these sort of sweep positions. Or it could mean that similar selection pressures are acting on all these populations in Europe. Maybe the same insecticides are going to be used, I, I don't know what. And so using these sort of approaches, uh, we found actually uh, lots of sweep signatures in the genome, including uh, uh, managing to confirm previously identified sweeps that were independently identified by other groups. 
but we had better evidence that they're shared across populations and including finding new sweeps, uh, so previously unknown sweeps. But again, if you see this pattern, it's no proof that selection has been acting there. So you sort of need to do more work to really firm it up. And so just to finish, I want to say that there's many, many methods for detecting signatures of selection and adaptation in genomic data. Um, of them we have actually not talked about because there's so many but we talked a little bit about pi and segregating sites and the HKA test there's tests that are based mainly on uh, levels of linkage disequilibrium we've talked a little bit about the skew and the allele frequency spectrum so here the most well-known statistic is Tachimas D but there's also other statistics that are related that all have pros and cons it's like you when you have a bunch of data you need to make up your mind which statistical model are you going to use. The best is to think about that beforehand, but in many situations there are alternative statistical tests that are sort of equally good, but they all make slightly different assumptions. So at the end you need to make a choice, and there's always some pros and cons. The same is true often with statistical tests. It's, in many situations it's not clear which test to use, because there's alternative tests. That, that can be equally used, but they might differ a little bit in the assumptions they make. The same is true when we try to detect selection. And so there's like, uh, uh, yeah, so lots of different statistics, including, for example, FST, which I'm going to speak more about when I come to my empirical studies. So FST is this measure of how divergent populations are. Uh, there's also another statistic called DXY, and so a lot of people do uh, use FST scans or look for FST outliers and they look for signatures of selection. So you see here there's like uh, lots of different tests that have different pros and cons and, and use different input data. And so here's just like an example that I, I, I like and we're not going to go into details, but this is, I, I feel, is like what should be done optimally, which is to use multiple methods of inference. Because what we're inferring, trying to infer, is something very complicated. And so this is an is a example from stickleback fish that we have looked at before. So the marine stickleback have these body armor plates. But when you bring these stickleback, when they, when they enter freshwater, and they live in freshwater, and there's freshwater populations of them, they tend to lose these armor plates. And the gene region that is responsible for this, and the alleles are known. It's a gene called EDA. And so here they looked at this EDA gene region and they looked at molecular signatures of selection around EDA using high density genotyping arrays, so not even whole genome sequencing. But so what they did is to use different methods. On the one hand, they did a scan to look at heterozygosity or patterns of genetic variability. And so here in the gray box here, in that region, they saw as compared to you know, the neighboring genome, a localized reduction in the level of heterozygosity. But then they also used other statistics, like for example, Fay and Wu's age, which is a statistic that we didn't talk about, and they found some signal there. And then they also looked at average FST, which is this measure of population differentiation, and they saw here localized, strongly increased genetic divergence. So in other words, without going into details, they've leveraged several statistics to sort of firm up that there's something special going on here in that region. It still doesn't experimentally prove that this means adaptation, but, but by using different statistics and looking at different aspects quantitatively, you can get more solid evidence that selection might be involved. That's what I wanted to say here. And so now, um, for the reminder of today and tomorrow, I would like to give you two lectures um, that are really about my own research to illustrate some of these things. And I think today we, c we might be able to start with the, with the first one. I guess, uh, I don't know if this is a question about history, but it's, it's like, so I often hear this idea that in, in the past, um, people thought that evolution was kind of a slower process than it might be in reality. Um, but uh, do we have like, were there ever good examples of, of 
empirical examples of adaptation that we could tell that were happening on a very long time scale that could bias our understanding or was it more of a, a purely conceptual thing where the people it wasn't clear what mechanisms would allow adaptation to happen over short time scales i'm not totally sure i understand the question you mean better our knowledge of molecular adaptation is quite recent or yeah, so now we, we have these uh, methods. A, a lot of these methods yeah. uh -huh. that give us very concrete evidence that mm -hmm. there are, mm -hmm. in, in experiments and so on, that show mm -hmm. that, that adaptation can happen very quickly. Right. Right? And I often hear that, that uh, the, the majority view in evolution in the past was that adaptation uh -huh. tends to be a slow process. process yes. But was, was that based on any kind of empirical evidence? That th were there clear examples of adaptation? That things where were you slow? Or was it more of a conceptual gap where people, uh, it wasn't clear what mechanisms yes. would allow? I think that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I would say that I guess people were thinking a lot about speciation. And we all know that speciation does not equal adaptation and selection. Uh, we, we talked about the fact that species could just originate because of genetic drift, just for neutral reasons or whatever. Continent plates drift away, plate tectonics or whatever. There could, might not be any selection evolved. I mean, that's, at least that's a simple null model. And so I think like people realize that in many cases, uh, speciation takes a long time, right? And, so we had like Darwin's observations, which were partly based on fossils and natural history observations. But I would say that people didn't have a very good understanding of time scales. Like around Darwin's time in physics, Lord Kelvin, who gave us the Kelvin, he thought that planet Earth is much, you know, is, is much younger than it actually is. And in, for the first edition of Darwin, I think in the f very first edition, there were like some time estimates. And this really caused Darwin huge problems because the Earth was not old enough for evolution to have ha happened in, in, a, in a sensible way. So I think like part of the reason is that people didn't know so much about the time scales on which things happen. And there might have been some biases by thinking a lot about speciation. Uh, by you know f looking at the fossil record and you know the molecular clock for example and these things molecular evolution that was a uh, sucre candle and pauling came up with the concept of the molecular clock in the 60s linus pauling being a chemist who win, won two nobel prizes one for um, chemistry and the other one for um, um, peace and, and he worked out the nature of the chemical bond. And he happened to be interested in hemoglobin protein. And then they figured out when they compared hemoglobin protein sequences among different species, that the, the sequences seemed to change over time at a constant rate. So like molecular dating couldn't be done before the 60s. All these things, coalescent theory came about in the 1980s. And, and of course, people already did selection experiments. So Darwin could have, could have uh, realized or said maybe more about the fact that selection could perhaps be fast because he knew about pigeon and dog breeders and animal and plant breeding. So there you can see that when you strongly select on something, you can produce amazing phenotypic divergence and variability in no, no amount of time. But I think he didn't really talk too much about this. Uh, or think too much about this. So this realization that things can happen rather fast on ecological timescales, I would say is, is, is relatively recent, even though you could argue, well, it's maybe sort of a no-brainer to some extent. That and, and the interesting question is like, why is it sometimes fast and why is it sometimes slow? And often you could like think like, okay, so if we take the Darwin's uh, finches, like the beach, uh, the, 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 the peak size changes. If you look at these selection differentials and these numbers, I mean, with, within, a, within, you know, a, a few dozen generations or so, or like, you know, a relatively short amount of time, I should say, like these finches would like be expected to become much, much bigger, like they, but they're not. And, and 
Part of the reason might be because the selection pressures are changing force and back and force and back and force and back. And if you would look over a long time, you would not even see that the peak shape changes. But it changes a lot. And so the, 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 a, a big empirical question that my friend Paul Schmidt, the guy um, with, um, who is doing this stuff in, in the mesocosm cages in Philadelphia, and, and, and his colleague Dimitri Petrov and some of us are interested in. One question is really, what is, the, what is the temporal scale and what is the spatial scale of adaptation? And we know relatively little about this. So, so one thing that we're wondering is, if we look at fruit fly populations locally in some fruit orchard, how much microstructure is there and, and what are the right scales? And so this is still, uh, I would say, uh, to some extent, an uh, open problem that people are really interested in. And now people are really hyped about rapid adaptation. Of course, from viruses and bacteria, we know it. But there, it's sort of trivial. Their things are fast because their population sizes are humongous, right? Everything can happen. It's, it's a matter of probability, so, yeah. Other questions? Right. Um, and so if you're more interested in, in this, uh, in sort of the technical aspects of how people work with, do population genetics with sequencing data, I can really recommend this book. This is not a textbook to introduce you to population genetics. It assumes that you know some population genetics, but it explains you sort of all the methods that are out there to quantify things, and especially if you deal with sequencing data that can be quite useful right okay so uh, Natalia could we pull up uh, the next lecture which is this one I think it's probably number three or four um, yes exactly perfect yeah so maybe we just take a, a, a five minute uh, toilet and respiration. We have like 15 minutes. Um, what I wanted to do is to talk with you a little bit about some of the research we're doing in my lab. Um, and part of this deals with the evolution of aging and longevity. Um, I guess I'm somewhere in between this guy and this guy. Um, and so here is again uh, our friend uh, Dick Lewentin and one of my favorite books that I've mentioned already. And uh, so one of the things that we're really interested in in my lab is, is, re is, is to relate variation in fitness-related tra traits, phenotypic traits. We also call them fitness components to variation at the low side that control them. So that's, that's the thing that really interests me. It's not just like population genetics and sequencing and finding signatures of sweeps, but I'm really interested in the phenotypes and I would like to sort of be able to connect the, the genes to the phenotypes. And, and this book talks a lot about this. And so fitness components or fitness related traits or sometimes we also call them life history traits include things like developmental rate or developmental time of organisms, uh, their patterns of age specific survival, how well do organisms survive from one age class to the next, how long do they live is related to that and also patterns of fecundity and fertility. So why are these traits interesting? Because together, these traits determine Darwinian fitness. So in population genetics, we never talk about phenotypes, really. We, we talk about the abstract phenotype that we call fitness, but it's really not trivial to define what fitness is. And selection acts on phenotype. Selection doesn't see my nucleotide sequence. Well, in, in a way, it also doesn't see how many babies they have, but... but um, but selection is sort of acting on phenotypes and phenotypic differences. And when selection then operates, these phenotypic differences or what gets favored or disfavored by selection will they have consequences at the genetic level. Um, but, but in a way, selection is really about these uh, uh, fitness-related traits. And together, these traits interact to determine Darwinian fitness. So in population genetics, we just use a shorthand, some number that we call the selection uh, coefficient or whatever, or the relative fitness of an allele 
But ultimately, this stuff has to do with these traits. And so in my lab, we're really interested in measuring these traits and figuring out how they evolve and what is the genetic basis. So for example, if I see that uh, some fly populations out there are much larger, the flies are much larger than in some other place, and I know this is a genetic difference, what interests me is to figure out which genes underlie that. And so that goes beyond population genetics, obviously. So what is the genetic basis of variation in fitness-related traits? And in his preface, Lewontin says, like, this is the biggest unresolved problem in evolutionary biology in the 70s. So they didn't, they didn't do sequencing yet, but they had, like, these surveys of allozyme electrophoresis, and he said, like, it's amazing how much variability we discovered, much more than we anticipated. That's amazing, but it still really doesn't tell us what we really want to know which is how much variability is there in things connected to Darwinian fitness. And that's, that's a hard problem. And so part of the work uh, uh, that, that I'm uh, doing in, in, in our group that we're doing is, is looking at aging. And this is sort of an evolutionary puzzle. And so the question is like, why do organisms even age? And why is it that we all age? I mean, and, and then at some point die? Is that, is that inevitable or are there maybe organisms that are immortal or at least that do not age? And nowadays we believe that there might be organisms that they might well die, but they don't seem to age. By aging, we mean the age progressive or age specific deterioration of our physiological state, which means that the likelihood that I can't run as fast as some of you is quite high for example, right? because I'm older. But so this is uh, chronologically old. Um, but uh, aging is sort of an evolutionary puzzle. And so here you have these mock shots and portraits of Charles Darwin. Here he was like nine years old, and here two years before he died. And you clearly see typically that he's aging and older, getting older. And so why is aging, the existence of aging, a little bit of a paradox? Because what aging essentially means at least for a demographer and an evolutionary biologist, aging means that fertility and fecundity goes down with age and mortality risk increases with age, right? But that means that fitness is essentially, I mean Darwinian fitness, not phys physical fitness as well, but like Darwinian fitness is going down with age. And that's strange. Why does natural selection not prevent that? That's sort of weird. How can natural selection, which often we think about in terms of competition, maybe as Herbert Spencer paraphrased it, survival of the fittest. This is a strange phrase. It actually not, has not been coined by Darwin, but by Spencer. If we think about this picture of selection being about competition between genotypes, the most fit like being selected and sort of winning that race, how can we go from, from this picture to the clearly maladaptive state of aging that should be prevented by powerful selection. That's sort of weird. Organisms age and die, and how can that be sort of explained in terms of selection, evolution, and Darwinian fitness? Or in other words, why does aging evolve? Um, I recommend that um, I, I shouldn't do uh, advertisement for myself, but like this, this is a really good paper. <laughs> <laughs> with Linda Partridge, uh, who works on aging. I, I can recommend you reading this. Um, and so the, the, the short answer is that we sort of, at least in basic conceptual principle, know the answer to this question. And again, the famous population geneticists played a big uh, uh, role in this. So R.A. Fisher and Haldane thought about this. And then mainly these two guys here, like Metawar and uh, George Williams, um, they came up with population genetic theories that can sort of explain why aging might evolve. And then later, Bill Hamilton, who by some people was called the, the greatest evolutionary biologist since Darwin, he is the guy who came up with the concept of kin selection and uh, inclusive fitness, and there's something called Hamilton's rule. So if you want to know, uh, for example, why you sociality exist and why we have sterile ant workers, that have completely given up their reproduction to support the queen, then Hamilton is the person who has given us the answer, which has to do with, with uh, kin selection and inclusive fitness. But he also worked on aging. And in 1966, 
In the Journal of Theoretical Biology, he published a theory paper about the evolution of aging. So these guys have sort of helped to solve the puzzle of why aging exists. And so uh, before I show you data, which I'm going to do tomorrow, um, I want to briefly explain the, the logic that they came up with. And so what, what Fisher already realized is that the se selection, if we, if we could quantify in a group of people born at the same, in the same year, for example, a, a birth cohort, maybe we could measure how strongly selection acts on these individuals as a function of how old they are, from birth till death. And so maybe we could like come up with a way of quantifying how strong natural selection acts. And as we know, natural selection should act strongly on fertility and survival and so forth, right? But do we expect this force or strength of selection to remain constant as a, as a function of age or not? And so Fisher sort of realized that probably in most situations, the strength of selection might be quite high when we're young. It's probably around the highest for you guys. <laughs> but then, I'm afraid, it starts to decline. And for me, I have already, I have produced twins. I have already, <laughs> from a genomic population genetic perspective, I have made one copy of myself. Huh? Because like my daughter, my son, they share about on average, <laughs> the expected value, 50% of my genome. So I've replaced myself. It's not so good for my lineage because I should have actually had f four children Then I would have not only replaced myself, but I would have produced uh, an additional copy. But for me, the force of selection is already much weaker. So in other words, the force of selection declines with age. And the idea is that for many organisms in the wild, the world is sort of a dangerous place. I mean, like we all watch these amazing BBC documentaries and we have these romantic visions of, ah, oh, nature is beautiful and the butterflies are flying around and blah, blah, blah. Yes, it's beautiful, but it's also really harsh and brutal. And so the world is a dangerous place. And that often means that in the wild, uh, for many animals, for example, maybe only few individuals will be lucky enough to survive to an old age. It's not impossible to maybe see an old Bengal tiger somewhere in the wild. But many of these animals are old. Um, and this is coupled to the fact that the individuals that do the reproduction are the young, not the old. Like in humans, at some point, we enter menopause. I mean, women enter menopause uh, and so forth. And so it's the young individuals that fuel population growth by being reproductive, right, and so forth. And so that means, as a corollary, that's sort of the logic, that whether you're intrinsic genetically in great shape or not, whether I will become a centenarian that can't reproduce anymore or not, I mean, this doesn't really not matter because selection doesn't really care. Um, so good or bad condition at an old age will rarely make a difference because simply put, the likelihood that you're going to be around at that age is very small anyways, if you're living in a dangerous situation. And so so in another way of putting this is what selection really cares about are young individuals that are in their prime, that are like surviving well, and who are um, at their reproductive peak, so to speak. And so we can quantify this force of selection and in many organisms, for example, humans, the strength of selection starts to decrease after uh, the age at first reproduction. Age at first reproduction is again uh, tied to this concept of generation time. So let's say we could say age at first reproduction is 25 years on average. I know that this is not entirely accurate, but it would mean the average age of mothers when they have their first child. Let's say that's 25 years. And afterwards, the force of selection would go down. And so um, that opens the door for different um, population genetic phenomena. And the first one um, is a theory due to metamor. It's a theory, but it was only uh, mathematically formalized later. So metamor just like had this verbal idea in this book here, An Unsolved Problem of Biology, which is about aging. He actually won the Nobel Prize for uh, immunology or, or medicine for work he had done in immunolo uh, immunology. 
um, looking at tissue grafts and tissue rejection. But he was also interested in other things and uh, also in the evolution of aging. And he realized if, if we could imagine that there's mutations that happen randomly in our genome, and let's imagine the mutation that happens in my genome is bad. But let's imagine that it's only bad when I'm old. And nowadays we know that such mutations exist. These are mutations that have age-specific effects. Let's suppose the mutation is effectively neutral when I'm young, when I'm a baby, when I'm an adolescent, when I'm a reproducing adult, but when I'm 70 years old or whatever, this mutation will have an effect that is gonna affect my health detrimentally. He realized if such mutations would exist, coupled with the fact that the force of selection is declining with age, these mutations could accumulate in genomes because selection does not select against them. Selection is very weak, selection doesn't see them, and they will not be effectively selected against. So here is the strength uh, force of selection on survival. Here would be for fertility. So, and here might be uh, age at first reproduction and in sorts of declines as a function of age. And if mutations happen that we have, it, we have them from birth on in our, in our bodies, we have inherited them from our parents, but let's suppose these mutations are only have bad effects when we're really old. In many situations, we won't get very old if we're living in a super dangerous environment, for example, or we have already reproduced. And, and both facts, the fact that survival probability is not very high out here and the fact that reproductive probability is not very high out here means that the force of selection is weak and selection is not going to care about these mutations. So they can accumulate in our genomes. So if we die before suffering the consequences of that mutation, then we don't care, right? But what happens now if the environment would uh, change, if it becomes better? So imagine, for example, we have modern hygiene. We can go to the hospital. We can now live chronologically too much, to a much higher age than like 200 years ago. So now suddenly, these mutations might have physiological consequences. And so we could imagine that even neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and things like that, or some particular cancers or cardiovascular diseases, they have a genetic component. And maybe people in the Paleolithic who had a life expectancy of maybe 30 years max, maybe only 25 years, these people might not have suffered from late onset cancer. They certainly didn't have Alzheimer's, right? They didn't have these late onset diseases, some of which have a genetic basis but they nonetheless had the genetic variants already for these things probably, and we are now suffering from these things because we managed to live much longer, because we have removed extrinsic mortality from the environment, and, and we can now suffer from these things. That's an idea. Yes, please. Uh, I don't know, but it kind of looks like for me the, the chicken egg puzzle, because you know, at, at the same time that, that selection did not see your nucleotide sequence, selection did not see your age, exactly your age. So it's seeing your performance. And this performance is totally related to the, to the, the, the mutations you are having in this time and the probability of fixation of them. So like you get old because you have mutations and because you have mutations, the selection do not care because you are older, the selection do not care for these mutations. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a puzzling thing, mm -hmm. a cycle thing. Yeah, so could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Did not looks like an answer for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah. I would have to think a little bit about that. But the point is, like, I mean, that that bad mutations that have a late effect in life, they will not. I mean, they could not be effectively selected against, right? Because, um, I mean, many people might have them, but like if no one is around to suffer their consequences, you know, they, they, they're, they're like effectively neutral in such a situation or, or, or not effectively selected against. But it's true that, of course, we also age because we, uh, yes. But, but, but this aging, the point is like, okay, so in the Paleolithic, maybe as a response, in the Paleolithic, the point is that people probably did not age. People probably died before they could age, right? 
by age, I don't mean growing older. By age, I really mean suffering from problems when I'm very old, right? Or like the physical decline. But, but they, they didn't probably really age, not the way we do. The reason we age, you could say, is because we're living so long. And then these uh, mutations manifest themselves. That's sort of the idea. Can I take one other question before we stop? Yeah. I guess just as, uh, I, I don't, I'm not even sure if it's a counterpoint to what we're talking about, but I, I guess to me, it feels intuitively that the question would be why there might be organisms that don't age because for uh, like uh, we, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, if I sh give you like a 30 year old computer or if you look at like a building that's 500 year old, for us it's completely natural that these things are not going to function the same way as they did when they were new because yes. degradation is kind Absolutely. of a natural fact about the uh -huh. world that mm -hmm. reduces to, to facts about thermodynamics and so on. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess <laughs> is, is the question, um, well, I guess uh, for me it would be interesting if we had like a neutral theory of aging, which mm -hmm. would be like uh -huh. assuming the human is just some kind of completely normal like thermodynamic yes. machine, what would be our age? And, yes. and then the question uh -huh. can be why do we live so much shorter or so much longer than yes. that? So Hamilton but sort of did that in, in his theory paper. He sort of like, uh, he imagined the hypothetical human population where there's no aging initially. And then he, w he shows that like this will kick in. I mean, it's sort of, I mean, so Hamilton would argue that aging is inevitable. And so that this curve, this curve here will look something like this. The thing is now, and this is an open empirical question, we now believe that there's organisms that do not age. Well, maybe they age, but they age at a rate that we can't measure. It's so slow, let's say. And for them, this curve must look very different. The strength of selection must stay high or constant for a long time. And so this is an is a open empirical. How do they do it mechanistically? And how do these curves look like? But so for humans, this is probably sort of a reasonable thing to, to assume, and for fruit flies too. Yeah. OK, cool. So let's continue with this stuff tomorrow. And, um, and then we can uh, talk about that uh, again in a little bit more detail. Because in fact, we can look at, as you say, aging, so to speak, of machines and compare that to organisms. And there's some interesting things there. Yeah. Cool. <laughs>